Hi, I'm Josh Steiner, Sector Head of Financials here at Hedge Eye Risk Management. Uh, we're doing another installment of the uh, Real Conversation series, and today we're focusing on financial services. So with me today is Christopher Whalen, who is the Senior Managing Director at Kroll Bond Rating Agency and the Director of Research. We're going to be talking about a couple of different uh, topics within financial services, uh, but first, uh, Chris, why don't you give us a quick uh, background on yourself? Well, I've been an investment banker for 30 years, worked at Bear Stearns twice, which tells you something about my judgment. Uh, most recently worked at a non-bank seller servicer called Carrington. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, April this year, joined uh, Kroll. I've known Jules Kroll for a long time, mm -hmm. and it's a really exciting firm. I mean, who would have thought that anybody would create a competitor to the incumbents like Moody's and S&P, but he's done it. Firm's profitable, about half uh, RMBS, CMBS, and half uh, financials, corporates, and public sector. I own financials and corporates, and it's, it's very exciting. We have a great team. So um, you put out a piece recently uh, on housing where uh, you know, the view you expressed was basically one uh, the bearishness. You know, yeah. Maybe um, you could sort of flush out at a high level what it is in the housing market that you're sort of you know, seeing and concerned about incrementally going forward. But the thing I've learned over the past couple of years working in the bowels of the, the mortgage industry is that this is not a normal recovery. Uh, what we've had is kind of this spasmodic, reactive recovery to the crisis, to a lot of the things that were going on. If you think of it, last couple of years we had 11, 12 percent appreciation in homes nationally. Mm -hmm. If you look at Case Shiller, for example, half of that was just closing the difference between bank-owned properties and voluntary sales. And what happened over the last two years is that discount for foreclosed properties disappeared. Mm -hmm. So really half of that was driven by the adjustment in the market, if you will, to mm -hmm. distressed assets. And then the other half was cash buyers. You have the highest percentage of cash buyers in the U.S., still almost 40 percent nationally. It goes up to 70 or 80 percent in markets mm -hmm. like Florida, southern Florida. So I, I think what you have to realize about housing is that this is not a normal recovery. And what you don't have is first-time home buyers. Mm -hmm. You don't have young families out getting mortgages because of regulation and even because of things like Fannie and Freddie and the way they tried to defend themselves uh, in 2008. Nobody noticed at the end of 2008 they raised loan-level pricing, which is a tax on mid- and lower-income consumers. They can't get mortgages. So you have a lot of structural issues in housing today that I don't think most people understand because you have to work into business and work with people who really know these things in order to, to, to have this, this kind of insight. Yeah, you know, we've, um, we've done a fair amount of work on housing as well. And, you know, a few of the things that we've looked at are, for instance, uh, the lead lag relationships between uh, demand and price. Right. And there seems to be about a 12 or 18 month relationship uh, where demand tends to lead price. It's a sticky asset, so it Very takes much. a while to reset. And what's interesting is that on a number of different measures, uh, demand seemed to have peaked back in sort of June, July last year. Yes. And has really been steadily declining now over the past year. And then sort of interestingly this morning, there's data suggesting actually that now inventory is starting to rise right. pretty significantly year over year as we move from uh, April into May into June. Well, you know, it's interesting. Last year I became an advisor to uh, Alan Weiss's new company, mm -hmm. Weiss Residential Research. Alan was the CEO of Case Schiller mm -hmm. uh, when it was sold well, 15 years ago. And what Alan did was the obvious. He went from zip code averages mm -hmm. down to actual homes. Mm -hmm. So instead of 5,000 zip codes, he shows you 50 million homes with square footage, the vintage, uh, vintage of the house baked in. And his thesis is basically that home prices move like a big herd of animals. The weaker assets, the less attractive assets, slow down and reverse direction first. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the cohort over months changes. So to your point, housing probably peaked last summer, but it was still being pulled up in terms of the Case-Shiller average because the really attractive markets were still doing well. San Francisco, the Southwest, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's done. And what he's saying is that in the first quarter of this year, home prices nationally were actually falling. Small, but they were still starting to fall. And I think that goes back to what you were saying about demand. The cash buyers largely are done. Maybe not the cadres from China, maybe not people from Russia who are mm -hmm. trying to hide money here. Yep. But that cash buyer that was opportunistic, that was trying to take advantage of the deep discounts we saw three and four years ago, I think that's done. That's interesting. Yeah, we've, um, we've argued in the past that uh, 
and a lot of instances, housing operates um, not like a normal good economically, but actually like a Giffen good, where mm. people actually buy more as the price rises. Sure. Interestingly, um, I guess you know, housing is both a consumption good, you need somewhere to live, but also an investment good, right? Is it or isn't it going to appreciate? Well, especially for the part of the population that has the money to play. Right. If you look at the government data, it's older Americans, over 45 years of age, that are forming households. Mm -hmm. Not a good sign. But these are also people like my parents, your mm -hmm. parents, who were conditioned to believe that this asset class would always go up. Yeah. And, and we had 30 years in this country when credit behavior, financial institutions, investors, they all operated on the assumption that you really weren't going to see losses on this asset class. At, at worst, it would slow down. Right. But now what we're seeing is we're on the other side of the, the baby boom. Mm -hmm. We're on the other side of the demographic mountain, and I think it's possible you could see home prices at least flat, if not down, in, in some markets. I, I agree with that. I mean, our, our view, and you know, frankly, I think the, um, how profound the impact that will have is very poorly understood. Uh, I think because you've got an environment where you've had, as you said, this you know, year and a half to two year tailwind of accelerating rates of appreciation, and then very strong appreciation that's now you know, in the early days of really starting to inflect uh, back down to zero or potentially even slightly negative. Well, you see this with the banks, too. The regulatory environment is poisonous. Mm -hmm. uh, most banks are losing money on every mortgage that they make. And so they're using the excuse of Dodd-Frank and the settlement and all this regulation to exit the market. Uh, it's like we're going back 30 years ago when thrifts and non-banks were the predominant players in housing, and commercial banks weren't there at all. You know, people forget that Wells Fargo got out of the mortgage business in the early 90s because they didn't like the business. I think you're going to see the same thing here. Yeah, it's, it, it's a really interesting point because, you know, for instance, if you look at the level of origination activity, oh, um, yeah. and not just on the refi side, which is you know, generally pretty responsive to rates, but on the uh, actual purchase side, we're still at you know, near decade lows. Oh. Well, look, when Paul Miller from FBR, a good friend of mine, when he's more bearish than the MBA, he's actually below them now, less than a trillion dollars in production for this year. Mm -hmm. That's a disaster. And yeah. yet nobody in Washington has figured this out. They're all still sleepwalking. Well, it actually, in a way, um, Washington is, in fact, maybe not causing but contributing yeah. to the problem, Very right, much. with you know, still further and further additional regulation. Well, silly regulation. I mean, right. Look. I worked at the Fed in New York. I got a lot of respect for them. I was at, at the Chicago Bank Structure Conference a few weeks ago, and they were sitting there talking about capital for three days. So when I finally got up to do my talk, I looked at them all and I said, it's not capital, mm -hmm. it's securities fraud. We didn't know what the liabilities of these companies were. And when we finally found out, we woke up one morning and there was 30, 40, 50 trillion dollars worth of paper mm -hmm. that nobody had taken ownership of. Well, surprise, surprise, we didn't have enough capital. Yeah. But that was a, an issue of disclosure and fraud. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with capitalization. So now, because the regulators, the politicians, can just barely understand the concept of capital, mm -hmm. that's become the solution. That's what you see in the narrative. Yep. And they're killing the economy as a result, instead of fixing the problem. You know, one of the, um, I mean, you bring sort of a, a very interesting, um, almost financial historian perspective to a lot of the sort of current your regulatory debate and framework, and I know you, uh, you have a book out now. Uh, maybe you can give us right. a, a quick plug on well, your book. It'll, we have the galleys. It'll be out in September. Um, it's called uh, Financial Stability, Fraud, Confidence, and the Wealth of Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, my co-author, wonderful friend, Fred Felkamp, a retired partner from Foley and Lardner in Detroit, is one of the uh, leading securities lawyers in the United States. I, I joke around, Fred is the father of the true sale. Because when he got out of law school in the 1960s, they sent him to the library to help non-banks do securitizations. Up until that point, all you had in this country was government finance. You had big banks, you had the US government, mm -hmm. you had Fannie Mae, and that was it. And they, they even hadn't done the kind of securitizations that we would see later on. The problem was this guy named Louis Brandeis, who in 1925 shut down the sausage factory on Wall Street I think Brandeis actually caused the crash because what he basically said is that if you don't uh, describe the collateral in a secured borrowing and if the two parties don't actively ascertain what they've sold and how they've sold it, in other words, if it's not a good sale, yep. then it's fraud on its face. 
And that decision was, it, it caused extraordinary ripples through the legal community. But ironically, the economists have never bothered to look at it. For example, if you were at the Fed before 1933 when we created the FDIC, you would never lend to a troubled bank. You couldn't. Because if that bank failed, it would go into the hands of a state-appointed receiver with an elected state judge overseeing the receivership, and you wouldn't get paid. And you know, the economists don't understand this, of course. So I think that you know, we've come full circle. In the boom during the housing, uh, you know, just before the housing crisis, we kind of threw away the playbook. We forgot everything we learned in the Depression and before. You know, a lot of the interesting stuff that happened in the 1920s came before 1929. The Florida real estate bust, mm -hmm. falling apart of uh, issuance on Wall Street. So I think that we're, we're really reliving that now. We have this extraordinary uh, regulatory environment because of Dodd-Frank, and there's no credit creation. Big surprise. I, you give this six months, you find you know, the Republicans take the Senate, and I think we'll start to see changes. Um, you know, money obviously plays an extraordinary role in politics and regulation mm. and the creation of uh, new rules in the, in the banking sector. And it seems like, almost in spite of uh, you know, the cash uh, spigot and just enormous efforts uh, to the contrary, we've just been crushed under this new regulatory framework. Mm. So Dodd-Frank and just you know, all of the sort of tentacles that have extended from Dodd-Frank. Do you think, where are we sort of in the, uh, to use the you know, baseball innings analogy, uh, where are we, do you think, in the regulatory framework, taking a you know, sort of a 50,000 foot view, do you think we're in the middle, towards the end? Are there still big sort of surprises uh, left to come? And, hmm. and, and how do you sort of con, you know, contextualize what's going on today versus prior periods in financial history? Well, if you think of the fraud and the shenanigans of the 20s and the Great Depression, as one extreme swing of the pendulum. And then you go through the 30s, through the war, mm -hmm. all the way through the Cold War, really no deregulation until the 70s. Mm -hmm. So you had this long period where bank balance sheets were it. It was either government finance, bank balance sheets. There was no non-bank finance. Mm -hmm. Then we go through a period of deregulation because they wanted growth. You know, when I was a kid in 1968, we had a battalion of paratroopers across the street from my house in Washington, D.C. We needed growth. Mm -hmm. So we went all the way down the road to 2008. Again, very liberal, no attention to fraud. Alan Greenspan with the famous Greenspan put, don't worry sure. about fraud, right? Now we've gone full circle, and we've swung the pendulum way too far, but we really haven't addressed the issues. In other words, we haven't inoculated the country against doing stupid things because Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and Bob Rubin all said we can't punish fraud. So we don't talk about that. My sense is that it's going to take years for us to readjust, mm -hmm. simply because as a democracy, it takes us a long time to figure out what went wrong. The judges, the politicians, it takes time, as it did in the 20s. It took them almost 10 years to figure out what had been going on on Wall Street before they really focused on it. And today, we don't have a dictator in place the way we did with FDR. Mm -hmm. FDR could do anything he wanted. The Congress would just do exactly what, he, what they were told. So my sense is, is that we're going to have to go through a couple of elections, a couple of iterations, to try and rebalance between a regulatory civil society that functions mm -hmm. and having a free market that can provide some growth. Because banks don't do risk lending. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. I mean, the, the emergence of uh, the non-bank sector and mortgages, for example, everybody talks about this as though it was just a matter of the regulatory environment. But it's not. The banks don't want to be in this business. They can't. They don't know how to do it. Another great opportunity, I think, for the future for investors is consumer finance. Not just autos, you see the way subprime auto paper has behaved, mm -hmm. but just all types of consumer finance where banks don't want to do that business. If you run a small business, let's say you've got an oil company in New York, right, and you've got to buy oil from one of the big guys downstate, you're going to need accounts receivable finance. The banks don't want to do that business. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's just a question of, of, of raising capital, dealing with the regulatory environment, maybe tweaking some of these laws, mm -hmm. and slowly over time rebuilding non-bank finance because, you know, realize the banks rolled up that whole sector over 20 years. Mm -hmm. They thought, hey, great, we're going to get in all these businesses, household finance, the money store, all these sure. things. These were not natural things for banks to do. Sure. So over time, I think you're going to see a smaller, narrower banking industry, 
And the good news is, I hope, is that we're going to see a non-bank sector that's somewhat more regulated, but it's going to be much more vigorous. And I think that's where we're going to, we're going to create growth opportunities. So I think the, um, the, the view at this point, you know, seven years or so after the financial crisis, is that you know, it's ultimately liquidity that cripples the system. Yes. Um, and uh, not necessarily uh, a lack of capital, although I guess you could argue that you know, concerns around the uh, adequacy of capital can precipitate the, uh, the liquidity. But do you think the rules that have been put in place uh, today actually address the heart of the matter? Uh, in other words, do you think we've, you know, for all of the opportunity costs that, you know, the economy has been, uh, all the growth potential that's been stripped out uh, as a result of all the regulation that's been layered on, do you think we've gotten anything for, you know, what's been imposed upon us? Do you think we have a safer structure now or do you think it's all been misdirected and we're really, you know, no better off than we were, say, you know, 10 years ago? Well, no, I would say we're worse off, and the reason is, is somewhat opaque, and it's not obvious to most people. See, the first thing you have to understand is that the people who work at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington are not free marketeers. They have an authoritarian, you know, fascist, European view of economics, which is very top-down. They want to control everything. And really, what's ailing the U.S. economy goes back way before Dodd-Frank in 2010. It goes back to 1998 when the SEC changed the rules, Rule 2A7, uh, for money market funds, the duration of paper that you can sell money market funds. That essentially cut non-banks off from issuing their own paper to money market funds. Mm -hmm. The Fed likes the idea of an economy where everyone's forced to go through a bank because they think it's safer. And you have the folks at the Fed in New York, the board, even today, trying to close all of the holes, if you will, in the Swiss cheese where they perceive to be risk. For example, they're going to put margin requirements on the TBA market, most important market after treasuries, where people hedge mortgage risk. It's going to have a devastating impact on housing. But the folks at the Fed don't think that way. They don't think about the non-bank sector as a positive. They think about non-banks as a source of risk. They want to put capital requirements on them, which, of course, absolutely requires that you also put ownership requirements on them, too. That's the only way you can have prudential rules. But the folks at the Fed are so myopic and so out of tune with the real world in terms of economic growth and capital formation, they don't even realize, I think, half the time what they're doing wrong. Hmm. But I've, I've dealt with them a lot you know, over the years. And all I can tell you is you don't want to let the economists run the world because they'll destroy us. You know, they're turning us into a bad version of France without good food. And to <laughs> me, uh, you know, I think uh, business people, especially business people in the non-bank mortgage sector, hmm. When I'm out speaking to the industry, I challenge them. I say, get up on your hind legs and push back. Let's go sue somebody. Because if we don't push back and if we don't help the Republicans in Congress push back, then this economy is not going to grow and we're going to have big social problems as a result. It's a very important issue. You have to understand that since the 30s, the Fed has been antithetical to our free market democratic system. They don't believe in it. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's an intrinsic um, sort of conflict, I guess, between democracy and uh, capitalism, where democracy essentially promotes equality and capitalism sort of leads to inequality. And uh, capitalism has um, been dead since the 30s. Come on. <laughs> we have managers today. We, we, you know, we don't have any Robert Barons. We have Jamie Dimon, who I love, by the way. So, uh, so what are the areas uh, within sort of financial services that sort of seem interesting, uh, potentially either on, I guess, the long side or on the short side, um, just thematically, you know, big picture, mm -hmm. if you're looking out, you know, over the next several years? Well, in the banking industry, take a look at the ratings we've been doing at Kroll since I've been there. We've had a new rating walk in the door with an investment banker attached since I got there. These are small regional banks, very interesting mm -hmm. story. Uh, all of them, they, they are really either banks that bought dead banks from the FDIC, or they just raised capital to go out and, and try a new business strategy. Interesting one, uh, Consumers Bank in Pennsylvania, Jay Sidhu, the uh, former head of Sovereign, mm -hmm. uh, trying to put together a business bank. Uh, Cadence, another one with Bill Harrison, uh, formerly from Chase. Same thing, he's doing C&I lending down in Texas, restaurants and oil fields. He's got a whole a uh, business strategy that's essentially trying to replicate Amogee Bank. Uh, he's got the former CEO of Amogee, Paul Murphy. Uh, 
So I see a lot of possibilities in smaller banks, these are even under 10 billion in assets, that have the flexibility to grow. Mm -hmm. The big banks are basically on ice. The Fed doesn't want them to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, the US Bank Corps, the BBTs, they'll be okay. But then there's a whole panoply of smaller, kind of 40, 50, 60 billion dollar regionals mm -hmm. that aren't gonna be allowed to really play until they prove that they're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, SunTrust, Key, Fifth Third, they all have to, I think, prove to the Fed and the other regulators that they're all right. Because they were, they were near death. Mm -hmm. You know, let's face it, SunTrust at one point was consuming all of their interest income with charge-offs. Sure. Uh, bad situation. To me, the more interesting area is non-bank finance, whether you're talking about mortgage sector, consumer finance, uh, even areas like aircraft finance, where Kroll has been very, uh, very active. To me, these are all areas where, over time, the investment community is going to figure out how to lower the cost of capital, how to work with the regulators, maybe change some of the regulations, and thereby expand. Because, you know, if you think about it, going back to what we said before, the only way we can create jobs in this country and growth is if we grow credit. This goes back to Irving Fisher. Very simple. You don't grow credit, you're not going to grow jobs. And this is why the economy is, has been so constrained for the last few years. So to me, for private investors, you know, funds of all kinds, these are the areas where you ought to focus. The banks, mm -hmm. w with some exceptions, are going to be a limited opportunity, in part because of regulation, but also in part because they're rationalizing. It's almost like the airlines. They're only going to do things that they make money on. Uh, a, a, a bank that can't hang on to a loan, a mortgage loan, and also keep the servicing. Mm -hmm. Remember, the day they close your mortgage, they're behind on it. They gotta keep that asset for two years before they're gonna break even. Right. Since Dodd-Frank has regulated away prepayment penalties, who's gonna make that loan? Because yep. the day that mortgage closes, your FICO score goes up, somebody's gonna come in and refinance it away from you. So there's both regulatory issues and then there's kind of medium to long-term economic issues, which is, did banks really want to be in this business? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Yep. So that, to me, is the exciting thing. I mean, the one area I worry about is broker-dealers. Hmm. You know, Wall Street's being punished uh, in a lot of different ways by regulation. I don't know how that business is going to work. I really don't. Decimalization, all of the other things that came in, you know, this kind of efficiency model, fair value accounting, all of that comes to mind. I'm not sure that's a good thing. I'm not a fan of fair value accounting. I think it's a terrible mistake. Yeah, I, uh, I would agree with that. Um, well, listen, uh, a lot of interesting ideas. Um, certainly, uh, certainly food for thought on a lot of fronts. So uh, I want to say uh, thank you to Christopher Whalen. Um, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, at RC Whalen. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, at Hedgeye Fig. This has been Real Conversations with Hedgeye. Thanks.